I was doing my job, my regular day-to-day -day job. I was just stuck and burnt out trying to figure out like, what do I do next? How do I grow my business? 2019, I saw my business 4X, seven and a half million dollars in sales, top line, from just putting myself out there with. Today's department is the community department. And I would say one of the biggest voices in my entrepreneurial journey, he's been able to build a multiple seven-figure business. And I have with me, Neil Dingra. I did this coaching and this other business as a passion project. You know, it wasn't even my main thing. And then as it grew, it just kind of like started to blow up. Teaching on the internet is the best way to help people. And then all of a sudden, all this cool stuff starts happening to you because you're helping other people. I wish I would have started what I'm doing now sooner. I was in the business for 15 years before I started posting video. 15 years of no social presence, no internet presence, and then just decided to start. What was kind of like your first marketing strategy or content marketing strategy like at a bare minimum you're like okay that i can do so all i did was welcome to the department where we have conversations with people who are killing it in their department today's department is the community department i have the luxury uh i, I would say the the favor to call this person a friend and i would say one of the biggest voices in my entrepreneurial journey, especially in this last year, as I've stepped out and um, you know offered myself as a coach and consultant to other people. And I have with me Neil Dingra, who is a content creator, a loan officer who actually educates other people in real estate on how to market themselves and get themselves in front of people. But ultimately, I've loved seeing Neil build his community, these raving fans, legit, that I've just wanted to essentially give him money and he's been able to build a multiple seven figure business, never really selling hard, never really acting thirsty. And honestly, I just appreciate your friendship and I'm so excited that you're on the department. Welcome, Neil Dingra. Thank you, bro. And it's dope to be on the podcast that's blowing up right now. Yeah, no. It's cool. Like you don't give yourself enough credit for how you launched this podcast. That was huge, bro. Thanks, dude. I that appreciate it. And you've always been just the one, uh, one I've always known that like, when, when I thought about it's time to start a podcast, there's there was like 10 names and yeah. you were top, one of those top 10 names. So th this is honestly um, a conversation I've been dying to get recorded, captured, 100%. because seeing what you've done, even from when I first met you, I think the first time we like met met was May of 2022 yep. at Girl With Video Live. Um, but before that, I saw that you were doing stuff, you know, speaking at um, Ryan's event and, um, and I just want to kind of jump into the journey, uh, not too far back, but kind of like, how have you been able to build, I would say, raving fans, you know, people that just know who you are, uh, not only in your industry, but also um, just in the digital marketing space. Yeah. And when you talk about like people who launch consulting events, courses, masterminds, all these types of products, and you say people are like fans willing to give you money. I think it starts with like building community first, but then also them being able to uh, trust that, you know, this is a good person who's gonna help me. Like, is this gonna work for me? So I think like that's the first part that people, you know, will be like, why is this person able to sell so much more than this person? It's because you come from a place of service. You, it wasn't about the product or sale or the money. It was about like really just helping people. So that's my first thing is like, I did this coaching and this other business as a passion project, just a side side hustle sort of, you know, it wasn't even my main thing. And then as it grew, it just kind of like started to blow up. So it was kind of by accident. And uh, I think like a lot of people will, will, will get stuck on that. Like, do they're trying to, trying to grow and get so many sales that it's like, that's the thing preventing you from getting sales. You right. know, you want it to be more natural and organic, especially like when you start pitching your programs and things, it shouldn't be like a struggle. So I waited a long time before I did that. So just going back kind of like in the recent most, I guess, applicable history for the, for the listeners, it would be like, okay, I was doing my job, my regular day-to-day -day job, which is a grind of just trying to help people buy real estate, help them with financing, loan officer, right? And then I started to want to, you know, get, I was just stuck and burnt out in that business, trying to figure out like, what do I do next? How do I grow my business? I'm at a ceiling. I don't really like the traditional way of doing business. How can I grow this? So all I did was start putting out videos, like cringe videos on internet mm -hmm. and start posting on we social. We all have cringe videos. Yeah, these are just the worst. I can't, you know it's bad if you can't watch your own video back the whole way. Like that's when you know it's really bad. So uh, that's where I was at for like a year, just doing that. This is 2018. Prior to that, I didn't even have an account on social. So like that was when I first started. And then 2019, I saw my business 4X, 
mm. from just putting myself out there with mediocre or some bad video because of like how few of people take this seriously and and not do it consistently. So and when you say that, your business Forex, you mean like your your mortgage, loans? Mortgage yeah, so my main core business, which is trying to get more clients every day t that want financing for yeah. mortgages and buying real estate, that business Forexed. And so that was like, oh shit, maybe I'm onto something and just kept doing it and kept doing it more. And so you know, I think back to like Hormozy, uh, he said this at some point, he was like, man, you should be able to make more money doing the thing than selling how to do the thing. Right. So like I did that first and foremost was just doing digital marketing to grow my business, content marketing by accident, and then got good at it somehow after a couple of years. As I was doing this, I had another big year, another big year. Then the market got really busy and I was able to capture a ton of business. A lot of people will tell you too, by the way, afterwards, I noticed this, people come up with like excuses to why someone uh, is successful. So that way they don't have to look at why they're not successful. Mm. So they'll tell me like, yo, Neil, you did all that business during those years because interest rates were low. The real estate market was on fire. You make millions of dollars a year because of that. And I'm like, well, why don't you? <laughs> like if it was just about the conditions of the market, like why doesn't everybody make millions of dollars when things are good? It's because they don't know how to market themselves. They don't have the megaphone, like, you know what I mean? So um, I was in a position to be lucky. Like, yes, the market was great, 21, 22. I made a ridiculous amount of money, but I was in a, I was like a good communicator at the time. I was yeah. doing events, I was doing content. So like um, getting good at these things, like gives you more business during those times. So uh, those years I had a lot of great business and continue to do it even in like a down year, like we're in right now, we're still relatively busy because of the marketing. So along the way, people would reach out and be like, hey, Neil, could you jump on a call? Could you teach us what you're doing? Could you come speak at our event? So just by accident, I started to like teach. Yeah. And then from there, I was able to launch programs and events. I think the principle that you, that I get from that kind of story is the preparation, you know, yeah. like, and you don't know you're preparing a lot of the times because the thing comes when it comes. And you said that like, we're kind of stepping into a more slower season, but this is the opportunity that presents itself to now start getting that those bad videos out of the way if yeah. somebody's just now getting into it and, and prepare yourself for when the market turns around yeah it doesn't matter what honestly what industry you're in um the temperament of what's going on right now it's a it's almost affording the ability to just start messy start putting out content and and get people knowing all people need to do is know that you do the thing that you say you do yeah and, and we talk yeah. about this like a lot where you might have even second guessed yourself I wish I would have started what I'm doing now sooner, mm -hmm. but I didn't realize it. But all those years where like I was doing work and not doing that much money and kind of struggling, that led me to where I was at with the content stuff and really getting into it, going all in. And then that led me to this and led me to education eventually and speaking. And so like, I think like all those things kind of just are on your journey of like, right. this is how you get there. So yeah, I wish I would have done content in 2015 instead of 2018, <laughs> yeah. but maybe it wouldn't have even freaking worked because I wasn't all in, you know, like That's I wasn't good. in the right spot. So um, I don't want people to think like, oh, you know what, dude, I'm too old or I waited too long. Like I was in the business for 15 years before I started posting video. Right. 15 years of no social presence, no internet presence and then just decided to start. And like learning so, the business. Yeah. Now you could speak the language to Correct. the people you're trying to help. Yeah, so, so like you, nobody's like counted out from just not doing it. Yeah, no, and I love that, you know, you, you were saying how um, you built the trust, you know, yeah. like that's why people wanna work with people and trust comes from showing up consistently. Um, I, I would wonder like what was kind of like your first marketing strategy or content marketing strategy, like at yeah. a bare minimum, you're like, okay, that I can do. So for the main business for mortgage, like I would put out videos that would teach like a concept. So what are the problems your clients have? How do you solve them? What are the struggles they face? Like, how do you overcome those? So that was literally the video of like, okay, make a list of those things. Each one is a video. And then it became like, okay, how do I make a better video? How do you start that video with a good hook that gets people in? How do you make it look better, right? How do you uh, show up better? And then now it's like, how do you make it better for this platform? So then all the technical stuff comes in. But in the beginning, it's like, is this a topic that people would be interested in? And a lot of people think it's boring. They think, uh, a lot of people say no for the audience, I notice. They're like, yo, that, nobody's gonna be into that. Some yeah. of my stuff that's done the best has been the stuff that's, to me, would be boring. Yeah. But it was basic, like it's information they need. So I think most people who have been doing anything for a period of time, a long period of time, 
you take for granted what you do. Like the other person does that once in many years, or maybe this is their first time ever doing that thing. So if you can educate people on the stuff that you even just do daily, it would help. So I started doing that and then getting a lot more business from it, but just from inbound, you know, people asking questions. And then what I learned along the way is, um, a lot of times, you know, you people reach out to you. They'd be like, yo, been watching your videos. Would love to work with you. That's great. When it happens, I like screenshot it every time, but the, there's a way bigger group of people who will never, ever reach out to you. They'll watch all your videos. They won't even like them. They just watch them like stingy with hitting the heart button. Like, you know, how many of us have typed out a comment and erased it because we don't want to look stupid. Right. So that's the general public. They right. just don't want to put themselves out there. They're not creators. So they're watching all your stuff and they'll never reach out until you prompt them. So what I learned was how do you get people to raise their hand? And so I've talked a lot about this recently is like, the best marketers in the world are looking for a signal, not sales. Mm. You know, like everyone's looking for a sale. Hey, let me know when you're ready to buy a house. I was just looking for the signal of like, are you interested? It's like you a step right in the middle. So there's a journey of like starting from the scratch to buying something. Most times people are looking for the customer to make that entire journey on their own. Mm -hmm. And you could just be transactional and get the bag at the end. What about if you added a step in the middle, like a webinar? Yep. Just to answer your questions, like an ebook, like DM me and I'll happy to answer or like whatever. So once I figured that part out, I was like, okay, I've got it. Now people are reaching out. I'm getting a lot of leads from online. That's really good. I, I call it silent engagement. Yeah. It's just, cause I'm even, I mean, most guys actually don't engage. It's like women are very talkative. They're yeah. they, girls, uh, women leave more comments on posts than guys do generally speaking. But that's very encouraging for people who feel like they're getting no engagement that the people that do follow you, they see your stuff. And this is why I think quality is important and that over you you showing up consistently delivering valuable content, you know, people, it wins them to watch the next one. Yeah. You know, every, every piece of content you upload, you're convincing them to watch the next one. And um, just showing up consistently is big on that. I do love, like, I feel like we share similar things in the sense that when you started putting yourself out there to build your personal brand, you had something paying the bills yeah, and that allowed you to not seem desperate. That's true. Yeah, you know, that's huge. You yeah. had leverage. I think a lot of people have leverage because you actually have a job mm -hmm. that, you know, maybe affords you the ability to use the weekends or, you know, when you're off hours or during your lunch to create the stuff. But if you, if you operate from a place of understanding, you have the leverage to do so you're being, it almost is like you're, you're starting out being paid to actually learn. Yeah. And so, uh, if you ever feel, this is kind of interesting, but if anybody has ever felt in a rut, burnt out, That's good. uh, stuck, like the best way to get out of that is to help somebody else. Mm. And so like, if you serve somebody else, all of a sudden you now are starting to grow and you're starting to get some good shit going for you. So what I found out accidentally was teaching on the internet is the best way to help people. And then all of a sudden, all this cool stuff starts happening to you because you're helping other people. It's crazy. So it's like, dude, how many people are just feeling stuck in a job or stuck in their business? And you have so much knowledge to share. If you would just put it out there, even if it sucks at first, you would get so much from that. So I think teaching is has been the biggest thing in terms of leading to business opportunity is like helping other people understand something. They trust you. They want to work with you. But asking for the business was the key part. Like I went through a long period of time where I'd never did any calls to action because I read Gary Vee said somewhere, don't ever sell. And like, you know, throw, how many jabs do you have to throw before you can throw a hook? I'm <laughs> yeah. like on my 97th jab. <laughs> Is it okay if I throw a hook right now? So what I found out was like, if you can make it about serving people, even when you do uh, ask for business, you get so many leads. So all these people who you talked about silent engagement, those people, when you give them an offer, will reach out. Mm -hmm. especially if it's free. So like, Hey, I'm hosting a free webinar on Thursday to answer your questions and to go over some great opportunities I see in the market. People will show up yep. like, but they've been watching a video and then they'll come on there. Like, I love your content. I'm like, why haven't you hit the heart button? No, I've crazy. never seen you in a comment ever. Right. And you say you love my content. So they've been there the whole time. Yeah, that's really good. I love that. So you said Gary Vee's one of those voices. Who would you say like early on you, like whose model did you see? And you're like, dude, I feel like I can do that. So I like Gary Vee's standpoint of like, he was saying content, 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 like put it out there. Yeah. Um, I, I was lucky enough to like, 
uh, he was at an event in 2019 speaking and I got a podcast with him there. So he like sat down with me. It was supposed to be 15 minutes. We ended up doing an hour podcast. It's on my YouTube channel so now. Fire. Uh, and he just kind of went deep on like all the things I could be doing. And I asked him like, Hey, I'm in this kind of boring industry. What should I do? And he gave me a ton of ideas for like broadening the appeal of my content. So like, how do you take boring topics and give them broad appeal? You know, if you're in a niche, like how do you get more people outside of that niche to watch the videos? And so for me, that was financial fitness, like ways to save money, make money, um, or, you know, avoid mistakes and things like that. That's Everybody's really interested in that. So I just started learning that from him. And then also guys, at, when I was coming up, there's this dude uh, who helped be as a coach later, Billy Jean, but he was all on the other side, all sales. So like, I was like on this side, all marketing, this is all ads and sales. Mm. And then I found my sweet spot in the middle. That's really like that. cool. And like you built your education, coaching, consulting business, like not with no paid ads. Yeah. So we've done, uh, it's been, this'll be three years as of January. So coming up beginning of 2024 will be my third year of doing it. And I think we've done seven and a half million dollars in sales top line without one ad, without one single ad dude so it's all organic i can only imagine what happened when we start doing ads but um and i will have to at some point like we have to start doing it because you only have so much reach really organically mass, mass market yeah but uh it's been cool to see like you don't have to like if you build an audience first you could launch your product fully organic no ads that's literally what i did and what made I think 110k on the first launch. Yeah. And you gave me so much game just on a 10 minute phone call right before I was about to tee off. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you, you were just like, "Hey, how's it going?" I was like, "Dude, it's going. I guess some people are interested." And you're like, "Hey, start using the word founder. Yeah. People want to be a part of something new." And something I've learned over time getting to know you um, is that you're very intentional with word choice. And I know we always talk about the art of communication and yeah. all these things like, um, like I, I know, I think the question I have is how have you discovered even just being, growing in your communication? Cause people, dude, when you get on a stage, people do what you say. Yeah. And, and what's crazy is, you know, everybody loves that you're you. Backwards hat, speaking at a professional business event, super chill, like, you know, the, you, I know when you're excited, but a lot of people wouldn't know when you're excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's kind of weird. Like, uh, I'm just more laid back, whatever. Yeah. Dry sense of humor. So a lot of t things people, like everybody says to themselves, I have these kind of defects. Like, or you know what I have, like me personally, I'm an introvert. I'm a nerd. I have ADD. All these things are actually my greatest strength. Right. Like That's if great. you think about it, you had to flip adversity to advantage. So everything that you think sucks, like people would connect with you if you just would be yourself. So if something happens, I think when you're doing videos, you're trying to uh, appease the audience. You're trying to like be like somebody else. You're wondering what are they thinking of me? And then something clicks. I don't know how long it is into it. For me, it was like maybe eight months in or something where now I can just be myself. Like, you know, I don't have to like try and be somebody else. Like I'm comfortable. That's good. And then when you're that, I think that's when it really connects the audience. Prior to that, I see people go through it. You can kind of see where they're at on the 100. path. They're like trying to be this person. I'm like, that's not you. Eventually they either quit or they become authentic. One yeah. of the two, because the audience sniffs you out eventually. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work. You can't, you can only pretend for so long. So um, once I was started to be myself, then I was like, got super comfortable just, you know, speaking more and talking and teaching more just as myself. I don't have to be super energetic, loud, jump around. Like I could just be me. And then what I found out was, um, with speaking in particular, I used to just get super dry mouth and super nervous. Like, and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't communicate properly cause I was so like, just the nerves would get to me. And what I found out is nobody's like stuck with that issue. It's just reps. Mm. So it's like literally the, I hate fitness analogies cause everyone does them, but it's literally just like you go to the gym in the beginning, you can't push any weight. You do it more and now you can do more, like you get stronger, right? So this is literally the same thing I found with videos and, and speaking and communication, more reps. You just get super comfortable with it. And then now it just clicks. Yeah. And you texted me last week, you spoke at an event in Detroit. Yeah, yeah. Like 400 people. Prior to that, you spoke at an event and you're like, man, that dude, that, that event wasn't that good based yeah. on like the, you know, response. Um, and then we, you just came into the studio and you started talking about what, what was different about that. Can you talk through kind of yeah, so why I it think was different? When people, uh, when you do a lot more speaking, first of all, like communication, 
from stage, webinar, whatever, that's led to the most growth for me. That's really you know, good. a lot of our customers have come from webinars and events. And I just want, coaching. I do want to say, you don't have to speak on stages. No. You can create your own stages. Correct. I.e. webinars. Yes. Or in-person workshops. Yeah, I ended up launching my own event because like I couldn't get enough speaking. So I'm like, you know, I'm going to do my own one. Yeah. And it's a great way to what accelerate. Yeah. Like, dude. <laughs> and the event is literally like the best event in the It wasn't industry. in the beginning though, but sure. like, yeah, it is now. But like how you, how you do that is like, dude, you are trying to be, you, if you host events, it just grows your, your brand so much quicker because you're the host of the party. Mm. You meet speakers. Right. You connect with them. Like you build actual connections with people. You can leverage that. Like people love it when you put on a great event because it impacts so many lives. And then also just, even if you just hosted the event and barely spoke at it, but you were just the host, yep. you would still get a ton of brand recognition for that. So I would encourage people, uh, Dan Fleshman told me this years ago, he's like, dude, just do micro events. So I would do like 20, 30 people event. And then I started growing, then 70 people, then 100 and so on and so forth. And now we do a thousand. But in the beginning it was just like, how do I get, 15 people to show up here and what are we going to teach them? Mm -hmm. And then that's how it got going. But yeah, for speaking, it took me like a couple years to get comfortable with it. It wasn't bad, but it just wasn't great. And so, um, as you're growing, I found out the, the best way to get past that phase is just to give a ton of value in your talk, like tactical things. Cause a lot of times people try and become like an inspirational speaker. Yep. Very few people can do that effectively. Like you can't get up and be Ed Milet and make people cry and, right. and get inspired. Like if you're new, it's going to be difficult. But what you can do is if you give really good tactics, that makes up for all the shit. Cause they're That's like, really Oh dude, good. you're dropping. I got to write this down. Like this is going to help me get business. Cool. So people love that. That's how I got through it. Then as you get going, now you figure out, Oh, if I tweak this, more people pay attention. They take action. Like now they, it's more impactful for them. They actually feel it. So here's what I found out. Um, if you can start a talk, with a bold beginning, people, it just goes so much better. So if you start weak, you're kind of screwed. So we've all had this time where we were called on to speak in a group, hey, they welcome you up, and you don't quite know what to say to start. Mm -hmm. You know what you're gonna be doing, maybe you have some slides, but you don't know that first line or two. If you don't, that just screws up your whole thing because now you're starting off an easy, maybe something, something weird. That's what happens to me sometimes is I'm not as prepared for that first walkout. So, uh, when I've done that great, the talk goes way better. When you do, when you mess that up, you're, you're handicapped. Like you've lost half the room sometimes because they just, people are very quick to judge you. It's like, uh, when a reel pops up in your feed, you're like, am I going to watch this or keep scrolling? I yep. think they do the same thing on some level with speakers. One hundred. They just like, they size you up. Like this dude's, I should pay attention or I'm just going to start looking at my phone or mentally check out. Yep. So. Uh, that was the first thing I learned. Second thing was start with a, oh, so first thing, start with a bold beginning. Number two was like, uh, teach people, uh, let them know what's going to happen before you start teaching. So give them like a roadmap. So in today's talk, I'm going to be going over like one, two, and three. I'm going to show you guys this thing and it's going to do this for you and make sure they understand how important it is. I think it's good that you say what the benefit it will be. If you listen to this, yes, the benefit will be this. It kind of gives people another reason to listen. Yeah, so it's like a bold beginning. A bold beginning could be a one-liner. It could be a story. You know, mm -hmm. if you're good, you can get good at storytelling. That's amazing. Like I noticed um, Irwin, who's really good at this. He was just on your podcast. Like he spoke at our event. I've seen him speak a few times. He starts with an amazing story every talk. Like, mm -hmm. you know, that's the beginning. He doesn't intro himself. First word out of his mouth is like setting up the story. Yep. And then it captures you in, and it always comes back around to his talk. So like, obviously you don't wanna tell a story that's completely unrelated. You wanna be able to close that circle. Yep. So starting with a story or a bold beginning, then letting people know what you're gonna be teaching them today and how it benefits them so that they pay attention. Um, I do this a lot, I don't know if you noticed, I'll ask for a callback from the audience. Like, yep. would that be interesting to you guys? Are you with me? Is this helping you guys? And just try and get interaction. Because if you look at the learning pyramid, Lecture, learning from a lecture is the uh, hardest place to learn. Dang. It's where people uh, have the most trouble. That's why we hate school. You know, it's just sitting, getting lecture is probably the worst environment to learn. Isn't that crazy? Because it's like the environment gets the blame, but yeah, it really goes down to the, yeah. But it, the format gets the blame, but the, it really, if, if the, when the teacher is charismatic or when the teacher is good yeah. at teaching, you, that's your favorite class. It's still a lecture. So that's why it really like, it just really shows the power of communication. 100%. So that's, the deck is stacked against you because the right. format is tough. It's not like the demonstration, learning together, 
learning by doing, those are way higher up on the learning pyramid. But the worst part of the pyramid is like sitting in a lecture. Okay, so deck stacked against you, how do you make it good? So then like you're grabbing people's attention, you're telling them what's gonna happen. And then throughout the talk, if you have stories, personal stories, and you definitely have to do this by the end, I found is you have to have uh, tap into some emotion. So like, what's the struggle you're helping people overcome? You know, like maybe you overcame it and you could talk about that, but talk about some sort of struggle so that the audience gets emotional. Mm. So one of the things I talk about in my talks is like, hey, before we even get into this, I wanna show you my proudest, uh, my biggest achievement in life. And I show a picture of my family. And every time like, I could get a little emotional about it because I'm like, you know, this is why I do what I do. And so I've had a period in my career where I wasn't putting my family first and I got kind of lost in chasing money right. and success and I almost lost my family. And so like I talk about that, people start crying in the audience because they're in that moment 100. right now and you save them. And it's like, hey, so I know this talk is about marketing, but if you haven't been putting your family first and you haven't got this priority down, like fix that first because I could give you all the tactics. We could do all this crushing business. You're just not going to be able to do anything if your home life is is Shambles. not good. So fix that first and then do this. Great. Cool. And then all of a sudden people are like, oh my God, all right, tapped in. And that's a true story. I'm not doing this as a tactic. I'm just like being real and honest. Dude, I like to say, use human nature to your advantage. Yes. This like we are moved by emotion. And even if it's a funny story, but like why be... Why make it difficult and just go against the grain? No, yeah. people want to be moved. You're a good person. You put your family first, talk about it. Yeah. Now, for example, if I was a terrible family dude <laughs> and I was like, you know, I'm about to get divorced, I wouldn't say that. Like, it's got to be real, but yep. you got to, so I talk about that. Next thing is when I was going through it, I was like, man, there's been times when I was so burnt out in this business and I would lose business to somebody else and it'd be pissed me off because that person was less qualified than me. Um, you know, this person was, you know, this, and I was like, I wasn't getting the respect I thought I deserved, mm. but I figured out, you know, the, it's not about what, you know, it's about who knows you, like, how are you known? And that's when things changed for me. So that's another moment for somebody in the audience of like, yeah, you know, like I'm in that moment right now. And so you want to like talk about your journey and maybe tap into that emotion because that's what's you're you're speaking to the former you. Right. You're trying to help the former you if you've if you've had a transformation. Yeah. So I would say like my biggest asset in marketing has been my own personal transformation. Like so I went good. from here to here. Yep. I'm nowhere near where I want to be, but I have made progress. Right. And I can help you do the same thing. And then people see that. And so tapping into emotion was one thing. And then so when you do this, uh, and everybody's comfortable in the room, if you start really well, they're just comfortable to laugh at your jokes to ask questions, you've asked for interaction throughout the talk. Yep. It's just a way more comfortable room. So they make your talk become super memorable. Yep. People remember you. And then if you are going to offer something at the end of your talk, like a chance to join your program or buy something from your products, uh, they're just way more likely to take action and, and work with you. That's so really that's the part, like I had done this talk, went really well. It's no coincidence that I had a really high closing rate at the end. A lot of people joined my program. Like, really because good. the talk was good, you yep. know? Dude, that's everything about that is just, it's the principles apply in so many different sectors. And, you know, uh, I, I was taught that you're, when you're the one teaching, it's your job to it's essentially teach people what it's like to learn from you. Yeah. So like, you know, when I teach, you know, you do talk back, you know, like some people it's one way communication yep. and um, it's, it's just some insight, but you know, no one, no one's teaching you how to learn. Yeah. So when you become the person on stage, like number one, the stage provides its level of, there's already a, a level of perceived prestige, I guess you could say. But when you let people know that when, when I talk, you know, you talk back, not, not in a mean way, but just like, do you guys want to level up in life? Say yes. Yeah. You know, you're 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 teaching them how to learn from you, which is building their kind of like trust too. Like yeah. because it's like, dang, I like the way this. I like the way I learn when this guy is teaching. Yeah. But just taking being in, it, it really comes down to intentionality and again using human nature, um, like w telling people to take down the notes. You know, like yeah. when you say like, hey, when you write it down it sticks with you and 
and even tell them what to write down and tell them what to yeah. respond. This All is these something things. you should screenshot. Yeah. Raise your hand if you've ever done this. So and you good. raise your hand and people raise their hand, right? Yep. And then uh, this is, I would definitely write this one down or screenshot it. And then people do it, you know, and then they start to like, you start to get in this kind of like connection with the audience. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is easier live, it's tougher on Zoom, I noticed. Like people, so on Zoom, the way I do it on webinar is like, let me know in the chat. If this is helping right. you guys, let me know in the chat. Yep. Um, and in the beginning, making sure you get people talking in the chat in the Zoom. Yep. So like, where are you guys all from? Drop it in the chat. Um, you know, and getting people. So some somebody told me this recently. I had a webinar on uh, that I did on Zoom, and we had like 800 people there. And one of the guys, he always comes to all my webinars, even though like some of the stuff is like repeated. He's always there. And I'm like, That's bro, why do you come? He's like, I come for the chat. And he's That's in the cool. chat. There was people like making jokes talking and that's the vibe you want that's cool like if you ever been on a one where nobody says anything all the screens are off the camera's off yeah the chat is dead that webinar is dead yeah like nobody's i mean people may be passively listening but they're probably doing something else yeah, it's funny you say that there's like a phrase you know in the church it's called a quiet church is a dead church yes and it's kind of like the same concept same thing bro like you know uh, i was i got to check out your guys church here in vegas people are always t talking back yeah, they're engaged. like the dudes around me are like they're saying something, even as it's not, it's not rude to say something. Right. And they're cheering and they're laughing and they're crying. And like, that's, that's, that's when you know, like in the right room. Right. So that can be done virtually as well. That's really good. It's important on, on Zoom. Dude, so many gems. Like, so you're putting out content. At what point did you feel, did you start doing like one-on-one -on -one calls and you realize that like people are asking the same question, I need to put together a program? Like how did yeah. you formulate what so is- my, I was uh, like, I gotta Neil's come up with content, my so. offer. Like what is it going to be? And so uh, I was, I again, you said you reached out to people in your network, that's what I did. I was like, man, I'm really good at this. I'm not good at this business. I don't know anything about it. Uh, so I connected with Billy Jean, who is good at that, right? Mm -hmm. And he was like, let's come up with a program that you could offer your audience where you could help them with content. And so we called, my first offer was Neil's Content Day. And we would bring 10 people into my office and we had my, I would bring all my media team in. So video, photo, speech coach, um, you know, all the consultant, all the stuff that would help someone get through this. And we just made like a micro version of kind of what I did, what I went through and get them through this whole process. And so I would bring 10 people in. And so I was shocked like- When you first did that, how did you know how much to charge and like, what did you, like, I don't know, it's just usually the yeah. first time out the gate. Like, how did you justify what the price point was? Yeah, I was like, how am I gonna do this? Um, what am I gonna charge? Is anybody going to buy it? You know, like yeah. you're wondering, am I even good enough to do this? But like I said, if you've gone from A to B, you can show people. And so I was like, I'm No, gone like from legit, what did you charge for it this yeah, time around? Yeah, so, th so I, I asked Billy, I was like, what should it be charged? He's like, oh, 5K sounds good. Okay. And I was thinking, that's a lot of money to ask sure. somebody for 5K, are you kidding me? Um, but he's like, no, Neil, look at this. Here's the deliverables. How much would it cost you to get these deliverables? I'm like, you could probably spend you know, several thousand dollars. Well, what if an expert walked you through it? Okay, that's worth something too, Neil. What if uh, the person telling you is someone who's actually like in the space that you're in and can tell you exactly how to do it? Would that be worth something? I'm like, yeah. Then he's telling me, <laughs> how many times vendors did you go through before you got it right? A lot. How much money did you waste? How much time did you waste? A lot. Shout out so to Billy. Five K is cheap. Yeah, you just like, made it from expensive to cheap. Cool, dude. It's cheap. Yeah. Like, cause I had, you know, how many times you hire the wrong guy? Yeah. And it's a waste. Right. Like, you know, how many times somebody give you advice that works in e-commerce but doesn't work in real estate? Like, what if it was exactly what you needed, and we would save you time and money? And by the way, it's gonna be fun, yeah. and you're gonna meet some cool people. So there's all this like icing on the cake. Now I'm like, okay, I got you. This is cheap. Yeah. Like, cool. I'm gonna make the offer. So I put the offer out on Instagram organically on like Instagram stories and sold it in like two, three days, 10 people, $50,000 so cool. in a few days on Instagram stories. And I was the worst at pitching. I felt so uncomfortable. But what I found out is uh, you've provided enough value. People see that you're doing the thing that and they want to do. they're waiting for the opportunity. They're waiting for the opportunity to work with you. Yep. They're just waiting for it. So uh, that was great. And then I got to continue doing that over and over. Now, when I say 50,000, it doesn't mean you net 50,000, but yeah. still that's the gross. Probably, you know, uh, it could be 40% of that could be profit, right. just depending on how you structure it. Um, and, you know, I didn't care about necessarily, like you said, I had my main business, so I didn't care that this business was going to make a lot of money. Sure. I just wanted to get it going. Yep. So I started doing that. Then after a while, there was a ton of people who I noticed, the way we would do this is people would reach out, 
we decide if they're a good fit. Like I would do a call with them. And I personally did all the calls. So I talked to way more than 10 people because a lot of people wasn't a good fit. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked to the, each person. And then if it was a good fit, both them and for us, we would go forward and they would pay. I talked to a ton of people who didn't want to travel out to the studio. So like it was always in the back of mind. I'm talking to all these people who don't want to come out. What if there was a program where we taught online? So I was like, I like courses, but the thing I don't like about courses is they become old. Like the information becomes outdated. And what if you need some advice along the way? Yep. So courses are commoditized. Once you buy the information, it just drops in value. And there's so many free courses, there's so much free information that like it's on its own, a course I don't think is that valuable. Um, there are certain ones that are, but for the most part, it's very tough. Yep. So I was like, what can, what is not commoditized? What is not uh, just another course? Coach course plus coaching. Yep. So what if I add in calls? What if there's a community aspect to it and you're part of a community where you can get uh, meet people and do business together. So I made a, a program online, Neil's Content Accelerator, which is like a course plus coaching plus community calls. And then also as part of that, uh, the course updates. So we provide like new scripts and new content because the uh, social, as you know, social is always changing. Right. Like what we're teaching now is totally different than six months ago. Right. So anyways, like that program ended up blowing up and we have thousands of students now. So cool. And I'll put a link to it down in the description or in the show notes. But yeah, you um, it's called Forward. It's the brand that you like landed on. Yeah. Like what made you land on calling it Forward? So I was literally just sitting uh, with Trevor at the office one day and I was like, I'm going to put on a event. Like, so I've been doing micro classes for people in real estate and mortgage. And then I was like, I'm going to do an actual bigger event where I'm going to hire speakers come in and we're going to do it like kind of. Uh, get a hundred people. It's going to be amazing. So what are we going to call it? Like, it can't just be Neil's event. Like it's got to be something. So I started to look at like, you know, um, what am I trying to do with people? And kind of one of the, one of the ideas was I really want to move people forward. Like they're stuck. I want to move them forward. It's just simple. And it turns out I was looking at domains on GoDaddy and forward event.com was available. Fire.com. Like you normally it's not available. Like, so I just typed it in and just bought it right then, that domain. So then um, that was like the base for event, forward mastermind, forward content, whatever. Like, so that's just the main brand. Yeah. And uh, ended up getting a trademark for some of it. Some of it I'm still in the pending process of getting, but like, yeah, I just accidentally bought the domain and then that just became the brand. Dude, I love that. I love that you just, it's how much people are waiting for their logo or waiting for the perfect name and you just called things as they were. No, it's yeah. Neil's content day, bro. Just come through. Like, yeah. It's you Neil's know, it's content like, accelerator, bro. So this bro. is come the problem. Through. If you're trying to get the domain, design the logo, build the site, do all that, you're just putting off the thing. Right. So what I found is like uh, new entrepreneurs, and this wasn't like my first rodeo because I had been in business, but new entrepreneurs are focused on all these things, the website, the domain, the design, everything being dialed in, the social content, mm -hmm. everything. Seasoned entrepreneurs are focused on one thing, getting customers. Like, that's all I wanted. It was like, if I can get 10 people to come, this is a real program. Yeah. There was no website, bro. Like, it was a janky fucking one page, <laughs> like free GoDaddy site. It's embarrassing. Like, I didn't even have a CRM for this. Like, so it, I think it, it's just a, what is it? Avoidance of the thing. Yeah. You're just kicking the can down the road. Like, yeah. subconsciously, you're just delaying what you should be doing. Yeah. And nobody cares about the website because you don't have any traffic. You know what I mean? Like the same thing like with content. You start putting out the videos, they suck. Good news, nobody watches it. So right. you're good, bro. Like you don't have to worry like, oh, what are they going to say? Nobody saw it. So yeah. you're good. Dude, love it. And um, so you've been doing this program. It's kind of like the, I would say your your core offer is now this, you know, yeah. NCA. Yeah. So we did NCA, which is like content group online. I was doing the content workshops. I started to do less of those because of how much labor is involved and the cost can quickly get out of control with the in-person events. So you don't really make as much, but I love the impact of in-person. So getting those people in the room, but once you pay for feeding everybody and hotels and staff and all that, like the margin goes down. So it's not the most profitable business, but I noticed I've made lifelong connections with people in person. So I love doing that online just scales. Like, yeah. so that's where money's at. Obviously, if you want to scale a business, you got to do it online. So I have both those offerings. I don't do the in-person one as much. Then, um, I decided to do the event. We did the first one in 2021. Uh, we had a hundred or 75 people. Wow. It was like a kind of exclusive because during COVID you couldn't do big events. So my buddy, Bradley, uh, who I met through social, 
he offered a program one day on social on his Instagram and I just bought it. So then I became his friend <laughs> by just paying him 10 grand basically. Like a lot of people ask, how do you connect with, you know, uh, big people, big entrepreneurs or influencers just buy their program. Dude. So good. It's, it's, it's like the easiest they, thing. Yeah. They just pay them. Right. And it's not that they only talk to people who pay them. It's they're just busy and they talk to their customers. Right. If you're a customer or support of their programs, even if it's a lower ticket, you probably can get them on the phone or get them to talk to you, yeah. right? So buy their stuff. Anyways, I bought his stuff. He becomes a friend of mine. And then he has a training facility in here in Vegas. So I got to host my first event there because you couldn't host events. So we did it kind of illegal, underground, whatever. Yeah. Uh, so we did the event there. And then the next year, I'm like, I'm going to go big. How big? Well, we're going to like get a big venue and try and sell, you know, a thousand tickets or whatever it was. I think 700 tickets to this event. And so we ended up moving, doing it at Resorts World for 2022. And uh, it was really Dude, difficult. That's crazy. That was your second time? Yeah, that was the because second me event. and Heather went. Yeah. And that did not feel like a second year's event. Yeah, so the, I just luck, luck, luckily had a network of people who had been doing events, and I just asked them for help. That's good. Like, just reach out to people, ask. And most entrepreneurs are willing to help you. Like, in my experience, a lot of people in my network have been willing to help. Yep. Because then it becomes like a mutual thing. You can help each other. Yeah. So uh, a guy in my network, Cole Hatter, who, how did I meet him? I bought his mastermind, right? How did I meet this person? I met him in a mastermind that I paid. Like all these people I ended up paying for proximity or access. And then not just going and being passive, like connecting with people right. while I'm there. Like go talk to people, go to do this. So anyways, he had been doing events for years. I asked, hey, can you jump on a call with me? I'm thinking about doing a 700 person event. Could you jump on a call? And just like you said earlier, like I was able to give you some some valuable information in 10 minutes. On that call, we were on the phone 30 minutes. He probably saved me a lot of money and yeah. headache because he's like, do this, don't do this. Do this, do this. And I was like, oh, dang, I was going to go a totally different direction. I'm glad I talked to you. He's like, yeah, bro, reach out You know, if you need help. So then I learned how to do the event. And so uh, I didn't do it perfect, but definitely was able to like do it and avoid a lot of mistakes. He connected me with like event planners and things like that. So we did that first event. Um, the hardest part for me though is like, I thought if you just sign up all these big speakers, people will just come. And so you build it, they will come. I found out nobody comes. <laughs> like if people don't travel to events. You have to like give them a reason. That's good. And uh, unless you're a big influencer. So I had a s relatively like small audience. I would post about it. A few people would buy tickets. So I'm like, holy shit, I've just paid out Gary money to Gary Vee all these big speakers and uh and what were you like all in on 2022 so what happens is uh you have a budget it gets blown you know it's like <laughs> remodeling your home it, yeah you should just double whatever you think it's going to cost at least so i was like i'm gonna spend 200 grand it ended up costing me half a million dollars okay after all is said and done because every bill comes in more mm -hmm. you know and if you want to feed people it's ridiculous like yeah. it just the hotels you know how it is so Getting the venue, the AV team, you know, AV can cost you 50 to 100K if you want to do it correctly. So all these costs just keep rising. I'm on the hook for all of this. So I'm like, I'm writing the checks, but I've only sold like $70,000 in tickets. Yeah. And those are the first biggest supporters, like your true fans, like whatever that was for me. They say you have a thousand true fans. Apparently I didn't because they weren't <laughs> willing to buy the ticket. Yeah. So I was like, dude, they weren't buying the tickets. All of a sudden, um, I flipped the script and uh, Pineda actually taught me this. So I, again, I reached out to Pineda. How did I meet Pineda? I bought a coaching call with him. Like he was offering at the time a couple thousand dollars. You could like do a coaching call. He was, you know, doing better on YouTube than me and like all these things. I was like, let me just meet this dude. Yeah. And the thing I said, he's like, what are you working on right now? I'm trying to launch an event. He's like, how are you closing tickets? He's like, I send them to this page. He's like, stop <laughs> doing that. You're wasting your time. Nobody's buying get them in your DMs, like mm. ask them to DM you. And then now you can follow up. And so what he told me and what my mentors told me is like, people kick the can down the road with buying a ticket to an event. The, it's not that they don't want to go. It's just that why should I get the ticket now? Yeah. The event is three months from now. Yeah. But for you, you're in a shit position because you're like, I need to sell tickets now right. to pay money. Yeah. Cause I need to like make this thing real. I can't wait till the end It's too risky. So what happens is people kick the can down the road and then they don't go. They, it's not that they don't want to go. So you got to move them to action. So how do you do that? You know, he's like, well, get them to DM you, uh, get them on the phone and actually close the sales. And then also you should be hitting up people and then personally inviting them. So I would reach out to you on Instagram. Hey, Omar, would love to have you at this event. 
So what I did was for the like two month period, I just sent DMs every day. Like I, I couldn't sleep without getting more people to get tickets. So I just got, became obsessed with filling that room. I must have sent thousands of personal DMs, not bullshit like spammy, like some mass many chat thing. I actually mm -hmm. sent voice memos. Hey, John. Hey, Susan. Like, hey, would really love to be there. Uh, really love you be there. There's actually your friend so-and-so is going to be there too. And I think you should be there because of this. And uh, let me know if you're interested and I can hook you up. And then I would they would let me know they're interested and then I would close. Yeah. So don't just send them a link and hope that they buy. Like ask them, invite them, ask them if they're interested. If they say yes, then close the sale. Yeah. So I did this over and over and I over. I love it. And, it. and it's like, it's not hard work, but it is work. It's work. Like you, you still, you still have to put it in, but when it was like, and then when it's all said and done, it looked like you just put it out there and it filled up. But like, yeah. nah, dude, you were freaking going in. Yeah. hundred percent. So I spent, I didn't run ads because when I ran the ad to it, nobody would buy the ticket. You would just get traffic. So yeah. you get a bunch of opt-ins, but not much sales. So uh, I figured out that you got to like actually close the loop. There are people who would just buy off, off a post. But um, if you if you if that's not enough to fill your event, you got to just go outbound and then start getting pe conversations going. Mm -hmm. So I did that uh, a lot for 2022. Next, the following year, uh, 2023, which just happened in this past July, we did a thousand people, and uh, it was still difficult to sell because events are just hard. You know, it's not easy, but it was a lot easier because I finally have brand. Mm. So like. You know, everyone's like, dude, just wait till you have the power of brand. I'm like, fuck, I don't know what that means because I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. 21, first one, 22, and then all the content, all the posting, everything. Finally, 23, people are like, oh, I recognize forward. It's like that they put on good events. Yep. I've seen that before and it's associated with quality. So like, what's the feeling your brand evokes in the person? Now that makes sales so much easier. So when I would post about it, more people would buy. I did, I did a lot of outbound, but I didn't have to do as much. So I'm hoping like that continues next year, maybe a little bit less pain. Yeah. And just continue. Dude, that's so good. Branding makes, uh, what did you just say? Something easier. Selling. Yeah. Or yeah, anything. Brand, branding makes selling easier. No, yeah. it's, Because they just have a feeling about the, you. Right. I don't have to prove myself. Yeah. Your and, event is good. Like I don't have to tell you why it's going to be good. You just know it's good. I think what's crazy though is like as a guy who's like, been churched and I've put on conferences and like really like really cool, awesome events. Dude, you understand, uh, you understand like room atmosphere yeah. vibes kind of going back to what you talked about with emotion. Cause that stuff all moves people. Like, where did you learn all this stuff, dude? So I was, uh, going to events that are all bad. So, you know, not bad, meaning like the speaking and the content was bad, but just those things. Yeah. The, but you noticed the, it. Yeah. I think some people would like go to a bad event and they're like, bro, that was the greatest event of all time. That's yeah. the problem. I noticed like, I'm like, why is it quiet? It's yeah. just awkward. There's no music. You know how much it costs to put music on? Not much. Um, why is it bright light in here? Like right now, like there's no vibe in the room. Um, why is there's the transitions are just janky. And so there's just little things that like catch your eye. And I had the benefit of like, other people who put on events telling me, hey, make sure you do this. And once you see it, now you can't unsee it, you know? Right. So I would learn these things. I'm like, okay, I don't want to be embarrassed. Like, I want to do it right. And then I also noticed that um, the if audience's ability to receive the information, have a memorable experience, and create a transformation is, is based on how they feel. If you can, like, do a few things to make them feel better, much more likely for them to remember what they learned there yeah. and possibly take action on it. So my whole goal with the event is like to change someone's life, right? I don't, I'm not doing the event for the heck of it. Like I'm trying to make an impact. That's good. And so if I'm going to make an impact, we just can be, you said earlier, be intentional. How do you want people to feel? Okay. Well, you can do things to make them feel better. Yep. Like, how do you welcome them? Like, what are we doing? So, uh, it's as simple as like, I have a small team, but like meeting together and letting them know like, Hey, People flew across the country to be with us today. Like they spent time and money and uh, their lives could be changed. It sounds cheesy, but it's true. They tell me afterwards every time. And so I can't do this alone. You guys are part of the journey for them. You don't understand how every smile counts. Every interaction counts because they feel better. You ever have like one bad interaction with a staff member it's ruins your whole experience. Yep. That's it. Like somebody was rude to you at the check-in counter. Like, it just sucks. Like, so everybody's on board with this experience. Like the client experience is so important. So uh, we started doing that. And then 
uh, do brief afterwards asking like, where could we get better? What worked, what didn't work? So then the next one's better and just so on and so forth. Yeah, dude, it's so cool. And I just, I love how you honestly attract really good people. Like just the people that work for you, the, your contractor, you know, help that you have, they're, they're always just so aligned with kind of like who you are. And just an observation I've had, literally even when you're not in the room and people are talking about you, whether it's to me or I hear about it or what this guy is doing, it, dude, it's that you like genuinely care about people yeah. and you genuinely care about the results. You genuinely care about seeing them win. And like, it's so felt like, arguably, dude, you have one of the best, like when it comes to like brand and what people feel in regards to when they think about Neil Dingra, it's so, it's so connected to that. And I don't, I don't know, like, where did that, I mean, I know you've been an entrepreneur for a while and maybe you understand that aspect or that tactical like thing to make customers, you know, actually win. Yeah. But like, I don't know, even more so, I feel like there's a little bit more depth there. Like, Yeah, I think it's like, um, you, what did somebody tell me? Your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. So like, that's really cool to hear people say good things about you when you're not there. Cause that's, that's the game is like people talking about your programs, product, service, event, everything, your business and speaking about it that way, that's your brand. Yep. And so, um, obviously like everybody wants that, but do they really care? So I, I can't like coach you up on how to care about people, you know, either you do, you don't, but, um, like I did notice that, you know, people that I've connected with the most had that quality about them. You know what I mean? So I always wanted to do that with other people. And then what I found, it, it sounds cheesy again, but when somebody would um, let me know how something I did impacted their life, that was a uh, highest sense of fulfillment. So, you know, I made money doing transactions mm. and that gets, it's cool. Like money is important, whatever, but it doesn't give you like fulfillment, you know, and it, it feels dumb saying that because there's people who are like, dude, I need money, but it, you'll find a point where it doesn't really change. Like right. maybe it changes when you get to like, a freaking $50 million or tens of millions. But like, if you make a hundred grand or you make 300 grand or you make a million, like it doesn't really, like you wake up the next day, you have to take your kid to school. Right. You got to like do the work. It's not like you're on a private jet and you're just chilling. So it's, <laughs> it's almost like the money is important, but it's not like it becomes less important to you as from a fulfillment standpoint. Yeah. So it's gotta be something bigger. And so I had this feeling, I don't know if you've had this as well, uh, where I was meant to do something more than what I'm doing. Yep. So I'm doing a job. I'm meant for more than this. I'm yep. feeling like punching the keys and getting people's deals done. Dude, there's gotta be something else, man. This is like, it just burnt out. It's just transactions. So uh, when I start teaching people and then they would give me that, hey dude, your video really helped me. I was like, that was like a, that uh, feeling becomes addictive. Yeah. And so now you just wanna help more people. Right. And so uh, I found out what got me super fired up about business, making the experience better, launching new programs and products is the feedback that you get from the customer mm -hmm. and the client. They're like, that's just like, you can't buy that. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I got addicted to doing that. And then it makes you wanna get even more. You're like, dude, how many more people can I impact? Yeah. How much more videos, how many more events can we do? No, and I, I think there's like so much alignment there that's like, you know, how do you know you're in your purpose? Like you you, you feel fulfilled, yeah. you know? And I, I would even say God-given purpose is that there's actual provision connected to it too, because yeah. God wouldn't want you to do a thing and like make zero and not be able to provide for your family. No, he's, you know, he would provide. But it reminds me of like a scripture in Ecclesiastes. It's in like the back of the Bible, but it says God has woven uh, eternity in our hearts. Yeah. That like, where our makeup, there is a void that is, we spend our entire lives trying to fill. And that's why people go to the wrong things and they think the money will fill it or the the substance or even, even the relationships like, you know, but like that void could truly only be filled if you are doing the thing God's called you to do. And, um, and I don't know, it's, it's just, yeah, it's just cool. Cause like even Pablo, who like is your video guy, we have a lot of conversations. We have a lot of things in common. And even his journey is kind of very similar to like my come up. Um, yeah. But he he just, yeah, talks, you know, so highly of you and all the things that you got you guys are doing. It's, it's just really cool. And I honestly, dude, you're, you're literally like a year and a half, two years ahead of me in regards to me figuring out what the frick I'm even doing. Yeah. You know, and... Um, and it's cool to see that it's not that far off, you sure. know? Like you meet people who are 10, 20 years ahead and you realize like they're just, I mean, they're, you put them on the pedestal 
but they're just people who had courage to like go after it. Sure. You know, and some of them aren't even that bright. Yeah. You know, like they just have courage and they don't worry about what are people going to say and all these kinds of things. They just do shit. Sometimes like, less intelligence is actually better because you're not like second guessing yourself. Right. So, uh, yeah, I think like it's cool to see when you're just being yourself, really helping people, people around you notice that. And then that becomes your ability to attract more quality people. 100. Cause they're telling other people like, dude, you should work with this person. And then when you need somebody new, you can just ask and somebody in the network knows somebody and then they're talking great things. So it's like a two way street. there, like, uh, recruiting and building a team. I'm just early on that s still, but I've found that like the better things you're doing, more people want to be a part of it. Mm. Like people don't just want a job. They want to be a part of something. Yep. And so we have like staff will cry at the event and really buy in. And I was thinking this the other day, I was like, how is it that you can get people to work? Like, you know, during these big events, there'll be like 12 hour days and they'll do it day after day after day and still be at the night thing, excited and laughing and having fun. And like, if it was a regular job, you'd be burnt out so early on, like you wouldn't be able to do that. You mm -hmm. just can't put in that work. Why is it that, you know, when you're in uh, video games, like kids gamers can stay up for two days without food, like they eat a bag of Doritos, right. bro. And they'll be up for two days straight playing games. Like if you were in a lecture or something, you'd fall asleep, like you can't do that. So it's like the energy they're getting from this whole thing is uh, so important and the feeling that they have by helping other people. So like tapping more people into that has been the key for me. That's what I want to lean into. Yeah, dude, it's freaking fire. Like just to speak on it since we're here and you talk about, you know, the money doesn't fulfill. Uh, bro, you got a Lambo? Yeah. <laughs> is that, uh, is it hype <laughs> or is it actually tight? It's dope, man. It's pretty, I, I love it. So I got that in 2020. So I've always like liked nice cars. I had like a G wagon or a freaking like um, a Model X Tesla, and just like always had nice cars. But what I noticed, like I wanted to get an exotic car, right? But I thought, what are people gonna say? You know, like if you buy a Lambo or a Ferrari or something, like they're gonna think you're who the fuck do you think you are, bro? Like you <laughs> driving around in this. So I was like, didn't want to pull the trigger. And my wife was actually telling me, she's like, Neil, you work really hard. If you want it, just buy it. I was like, shout out to Whitney. Yeah, there you go. Like, all right, fine. Like I got the green light. <laughs> yeah. And so during COVID. Unintended. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So the, during COVID, um, car prices initially dropped a little bit. Mm -hmm. So like the deal maker in me was like, dude, I found a, a, a Urus and uh, I didn't get a loan. Like somebody the other day asked, what's the payment on a Urus? I'm like, I don't know. Like, Here's the title. Like I just yeah. bought it. I don't fucking <laughs> know. Maybe it's a couple grand. I don't know. But uh, I just ended up, um, sending, you know, making a deal. It's $200,000 car. What's cool. What I also learned about this is, you know, Lamborghinis can cost up to four or $500,000. If you bought a two or $300,000 one, nobody like you still get treated as if you bought the $500,000 one. You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? Like they think it could be 400 grand. Really it was two. I think they're 300 now, but so there's, there's this moment, bro, where I was like, I, I, uh, Agreed to buy it. They sent me the paperwork and then I started to wire the money, $200,000 for a vehicle. But you just paid it for it? So yeah, yeah, in full. And so I was like, I was sitting there with the instruction on the page and you just have to enter. <laughs> and I was like, dude, should I really send this money to buy a Lambo? It's so like, it, am I going to be that guy? Like, it's so dumb. But I really wanted it and I knew it was a dope car. So I just like, I just hit enter, send it, fuck it, go. <laughs> now then the card comes and uh, I've loved it ever since. Like I've had it for three years. What's cool about it is it also has made me a ton of money because what's happened is it's just a conversation starter. It's not fair, but people treat you better. You pull up in a Lambo, people just treat you better. They think you could be worth way more than you are. I don't right. know why they think that because I could just be leasing it. Right. So I don't think it's fair, but I'll tell you what, like so many people give me the time of day because yeah. of that. Right. So no, and it, I, I've it, leveraged it for sure. No, and I think there's the principle, number one, that like a lot of people think people are blowing their money on this stuff, but like your car has appreciated in value. Yeah. Like similar to, you know, the watch game, people yeah. think that buying up watches is like this, you know, terrible way of investing your money, but there's so many, you know, cool benefits from not only doing, you know, getting something that you worked hard for, that part of it, um, getting something that either, you know, maintains its value or grows in its value, but also, yeah, just, helps you get treated better. Yeah. Like you can have a golf membership. And when you say you have a golf membership, people think something about you, but mm -hmm. 
but you could suck at golf. Yeah. And it's not about being fake. Um, I think it's just, again, human nature. Perception is reality. Yeah. So like the perceived value of a person who drives a Lamborghini, yep. you could be a POS, like uh, I'm not, but yeah. like, yeah, could be. But so what happens is it's up to you to blow that, right. but if you already get a leg up on other things. Yeah. So you get uh, the invitation. People treat you better. I remember pulling up to the club house where we live at in my community, a guy I was trying to do business with for the past decade who always blew me off. He came up and just started talking to me. I'm like, bro, I've been trying to get a hold of you. Man. <laughs> yeah, you funny. want to talk to me now? So it like flips the script on everybody. So uh, that's an investment. The other part is like, I, um, I don't know, like I, if somebody was like, dude, I'm going to, I can't really afford it, but I'm just going to like take it, like take a leap of faith and do oh, it. Yeah. I still You're, would tell them like, go for it, you know, because also putting some pressure on your shoulders makes you work harder. Yeah. So I could be in that position. But for me, I could have bought, you know, multiple in cash. So to me, it wasn't like a bad financial decision because right. I could afford it. So I just bought it. It's made me well more than what uh, I paid for it. And then also it's um it's gone up in value by accident. I think like a lot of exotic things have appreciated over yeah. time because they're just rare. Right. So it's to me, it's like a place to park money. Yeah. It's not no, really it's like a waste of money. So good. And I, I mean, it's kind of like why I'm trying to get on like the health tip because yeah. it's it you don't have to open up your mouth. You just, yeah. if you look like you're put together and that you take care of yourself, it's immediate, dis this guy, this person's disciplined. Um, this person cares about their health. Not then it's just a small percentage of people when you start thinking this way that well, actually, even what you teach in video department is right. like people treat you better if your videos look better. Right. Like what is the why do we spend so much time making it look good and, and sound good? Because you get bigger impact. Mm -hmm. So it's important for sure. Yeah. Dude, thank you so much for hopping on the department. Yeah, the Lambo of podcasts. <laughs> the Lambo of podcasts. Hey, that's that's pretty fire, <laughs> dude. The Eurus. Um, and uh, yeah, and the equity's going up, dog. Oh, the other thing I should say for people is like, dude, I bought rentals and all these things before I bought that car. Like, I didn't start with that. Like, I had investments and stuff like that. So I think like, get your priorities straight. If you don't own other investments, your first investment maybe shouldn't be a freaking Lambo. <laughs> yeah, no, that's really good. <laughs> start with something I would, else. I mean, I guess I would ask you, like, you've made a lot of money in the in a very short amount of time yeah what are you doing with those profits um to invest like yeah so i uh, my game is like real estate so i bought we have a bunch of rental properties that's kind of like my retirement plan is just you know have all these properties and uh rents come in on them and that rent you can never outlive mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter what's going on with the economy like people always need a place to live so if you have quality real estate to me that just helps you sleep better at night and then other things like you know stocks and you know um even right now because interest rates are high like treasury bonds we talked about like yeah. what do you do with just money that's just sitting around like put it into liquid things that pay you that don't have risk you know mm -hmm. so just park some money there uh, I don't really buy a bunch of shit we don't need, but like we have a nice house, you know, like things that have an impact that helps my family, things like that. But mo my biggest investment is is real estate for sure. We own a bunch of property. That's really good. And then as far as like a mistake, have you made a, a, a big financial mistake ever in your life? Yeah, like uh, thinking short term. So one of the things I fell into and, and uh, maybe people can relate to this is like trying to get a quick return, you know, like long-term investing, is where it's at. Mm -hmm. Like it's almost boring, but that's where you need to do it. Like you should take your risks in business, not with the money you worked so hard for in business. And now you put it into something that could go to zero. Really you know, good. so I learned um, about investing and I got, I learned about all these um, trading, short term trading opportunities, like stocks and options, but not to hold for long term, but just like get a quick profit and go. Quickly turns into gambling, essentially, you mm -hmm. know, because you're trying to get that quick return. And so I ended up losing like hundreds of thousands of dollars on something that was like, you know, just dumb. Yeah. So it just taught me like, hey, where do I want to put my time? Like, not in that, you know, I should put my time and risk in business. Then when you make money, take the risk off. Like so put good. it in just something for the long term. Yeah. I'll gamble on the event. Like, I don't need to be gambling with the money I made, you know, <laughs> yeah. from freaking working all day. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. let's do something else. So uh, there's time for risk and not. So that's what I learned from that whole thing. Dude, so good. If you want to check out NCA, Neil's Content Accelerator, check out the link in the show notes. Dude, appreciate you. Appreciate your friendship and even all the things you have spoken into my entrepreneurial journey. And I'm yeah, just man. excited for our future. 100%. Thanks for having me, bro.